So it is in the context of all of that that it does fall to me to use a patient experience, the patient journey of my own 21-year-old son, Kevin, as a means of first identifying some of the challenges in providing safe care and then gaining some insight into what it is like to be a patient, a family member, a clinician when things go wrong. And for your part, you might ask, well, why would we listen to somebody like Maura Murphy? She's a lay person. What has she got to bring to the table? Well, in response, I'll give you the Indian saying that says, tell me a fact and I'll learn. Tell me a truth and I'll believe. Tell me a story and it will live in my heart forever. And patients like my Kevin certainly have powerful stories to tell. The most effective tool we patients have is to tell those stories, and why? Because the stories evoke feelings. And back in 1967, Vera Keane wrote in the bulletin of Nurse Midwifery, facts do not change feelings, and feelings are what influence behaviour. The accuracy, the clarity with which we absorb information has little effect on us. It's how we feel about the information that determines whether we will use it or not. It's also very true that simple measures save lives. Simple measures were not taken and Kevin lost his life. And his patient experience certainly illustrates that in the case of the acutely ill patient, there is very often quite a long antecedent, antecedent period during which successful intervention is possible. And for Kevin, that period stretched almost over two years and a lot of that time was spent in the care of his primary care physician. So I offer you the ultimate vision that in relation to Kevin, it's his death certificate. It is small to organ failure, hypercalcemia, parathyroid tumour. People do not usually die from primary hyperparathyroidism, especially when blood tests reveal high levels of calcium almost two years before his death. Adverse events happen to real people. Kevin was more than a statistic, he was more than a medical condition, he was a young man on, on the threshold of life, a uh, challenging young man. He could make his mum laugh, he could make her cry, he could make me proud of him, disappointed in, in him. But most of all, he was my beautiful boy, handsome, strong and carefree. Kevin was admitted to hospital a mere eight days after this picture was taken. Three days following that, his sister, pictured here with him, sat with me at his bedside in ICU. Kevin had died right before our eyes. Nothing or no one had prepared us for this. We had questions, there were simple questions. Why did he die? How can a young man go to hospital on Thursday and be dead on Sunday? What went wrong? We need to know, we need to understand, will you please explain it to us? What we encountered was closing ranks, lame excuses, and money of the waters, as well as protestations of loyalty to colleagues. So disappointed and frustrated, we retraced Kevin's medical history over the previous three years. The story slowly and painfully unfolded. The failings and shortcomings were many in number, they were serious in nature, that were indicative of a system breakdown, and that was compounded by misdiagnosis, inappropriate treatment and management, together with issues of communication and data handling. And I ask you to bear in mind how laboratory results were mishandled, very relevant to today's discussions, and how those tests provided sufficient data which, if interpreted correctly and acted upon promptly, would most certainly have saved his life. In fact, the potential to achieve proper diagnosis and treatment was sabotaged. It was sabotaged by a combination of filtering of test results and inaction. And those errors ranged from his treatment of primary care level <coughs> right through to that afforded him in a tertiary training hospital. And that is why I say every point of contact failed him. So what was that unfolding story of Kevin's journey? Well, during 97, he presented on a number of occasions with persistent back pain. Without any improvement, he was referred in the autumn of that year to an orthopedic consultant. 
blood tests revealed high levels of calcium at 3.51 in a normal, very narrow range of 2.05 to 2.75. And as you can see, other parameters were also raised. And all of those abnormal results were highlighted in some way in the laboratory report. But when writing to the GP, the consultant underplayed the high calcium levels, making very casual reference to that his calcium appeared to be raised and that if that remains so, he would like to see him again early in the new year. Now that letter is not on the GP file. So as a consequence, Kevin was never made aware of the fact that the consultant would need the test through done or would need to see him again early in the new year. As I say, it's not on the GP file. We know it was written. We don't know if it was posted. We don't know if it was received. But all we certainly do know is that it didn't trigger any action. And I would be certainly saying that if you're sending important information from one colleague to another, the least you need to be assured of is that it has reached its, its destination. It, <coughs> it's also very significant that throughout his care, only one set of clinical eyes actually saw those test results. At no point was the hard copy forwarded, and neither did it travel with Kevin himself as part of a patient health record. And I'd be a great advocate of a patient health record, not because we could necessarily interpret those test results, but we would have an interest in them. And we would be asking questions about the elements which might be outside of the recommended range, or we might be in a position to compare this year's results with last year's results and say, oh, it was such and such last year, it's now this. Uh, what's the significance of that? No one else, patient or clinician, had an opportunity to revisit them or to question them. The opportunity to initiate best practice was, in fact, thwarted by, first of all, not recognising the seriousness of his condition, then the absence of a system to flag the high calcium readings in a way that would insist on immediate referral, and then not communicating the test results in their entirety, and thus preventing the patient from the benefit, of having that benefit of a second pair of eyes. Kevin's file contains a notation by the doctor's secretary, and I'll actually read it out. Telephone call from patient's mother. She's extremely worried about her son. She wishes you to know that she thinks he may be depressed also. Failing his first year exams, repeating and not doing well either, finding it hard to study. And this is from a highly intelligent young man. He is now remaining in bed a lot. She has arranged an appointment with Dr. X, X a psychiatrist, tomorrow, and would like to have results of the blood test bones and for the consultation. Now you might ask why are they taking the boy to a, a, a psychiatrist? We had been to practically everybody else. We were grasping at straws. She wonders if he really has a back problem. What can I tell the mother? Results in five. She wished to speak to you. And the doctor's response? Fax results to Dr. X. There was no direct communication with the patient, and neither was there any direct communication with the mother. Carers and family members are often dismissed as being over-anxious. And I would say to you, you ignore as your parent the concerns of a mother. Because I assure you that umbilical cord is never totally severed. So if you were to take one message home today from Margaret Murphy, I would like it to be that. You ignore at your peril the concerns of a mother. Only later then did we learn that Kevin's symptoms were due to the chemical imbalance caused by his undiagnosed medical condition and the fact that while his bones were being starved and softening, the viscosity of his blood was being altered and putting a huge strain on his heart. When adjudicating on the quality of Kevin's care, peer reviewers have later said Kevin would have had surgery to remove the overactive parathyroid gland, he would have been cured and would still have been alive today. Research tells us that the procedure to remove what was discovered at autopsy to have been a benign tumour 
has a 96% success rate with a 1% complication rate. Uh, and our family experience also bears this out because three months after his death, his death was discovered to have the very same levels of calcium with which Kevin first presented. And we saw him have the procedure which Kevin should have enjoyed and he is alive and well today. And Jean has been identified and as recently as 18 months ago, his sister also had surgery. So there were undoubtedly wonderful odds in Kevin's favour, but in fact, nobody was at the races. And that is again why I say every point of contact failed him, because the necessary referral to an endocrinologist did not happen, the diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism was not made, and hypercalcemia was allowed to progress for a further year and 10 months, by which time the levels were higher than any ever recorded in Cork University Hospital and were described as inconsistent with life. In fact, one of the peer reviewers himself, an endocrinologist, trawled colleagues globally and was unable to come up with a colleague who had a patient with similarly high levels. Kevin spent the summer of 1989 in the United States on his J1 visa. On his return, he attended his GP, still complaining of lethargy, occasional vomiting, continuing bone pain. His behaviour had become somewhat erratic. In fact, with hindsight, he was a textbook uh, manifestation, if you like, of uh, primary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, hyper he had the moans, the bones, and the groans. The only thing missing were the stones. He did not have kidney stones. Uh, blood and urine samples were taken and the results were telephoned to the surgery the next day and they were written on this post and notified by, by the practice nurse. And you can now see that the calcium has risen, really gone off the Richter scale to 5.73. Well, another key point of contact failed Kevin when the GP, totally ignoring those high calcium levels, only included in his letter of referral the elements of the blood test results which supported his own differential diagnosis of leptospirosis based on some of the other findings. And he made absolutely no mention at all of the calcium level. Uh, now, he did send that post-it note with the letter of referral. However, another key point failed Kevin because in that hospital, uh, when they were compiling his file, you can imagine it, piece of paper the size of the post-it note. They did not want it mislead. So somebody thought it a good idea to stick it to the back of the referral letter. And as a consequence, it wasn't seen until six weeks after Kevin's death. Not when they were uh, conducting a review, but when the two hospitals were in fact reconciling their claims for voluntary health insurance reimbursement. The standard blood test in that particular hospital, hospital did not include for calcium, so they didn't pick up on these calcium levels independently, and a diagnosis of nephritis was made. So it would seem that at that time no medical personnel seemed to appreciate how seriously he, he had become as his condition deteriorated rapidly. I recall speaking with a consultant in the hospital corridor and uh, we were awaiting his transfer to Cork University Hospital because they didn't have a renal unit in that hospital and they were con concentrating on the, the nephritis issue and in fact nephritis was a symptom, it wasn't the underlying condition. And I remember saying to him, are you concerned at all about the delay in his transfer because I have this desperate sense of urgency, that umbilical cord. And before he had a chance to respond, Kevin's older brother said, and what will they do differently in CUH? And he said, oh, they do nothing differently. Perhaps they'll take a biopsy Monday or Tuesday. We were speaking on Saturday. Kevin was dead on Sunday. For Kevin, there was no Monday. For Kevin, there was no Tuesday. Again, I would say, you ignore it, your parent, the concerns of a mother. Despite his continuing decline, no alarm was raised, he became dehydrated, described muscle pain and neurological problems. His medical notes quote him as saying, I have crazy thoughts coming into my head. And those notes showed further advancing renal failure. 
So the hospital did not have the benefit of his original blood tests almost two years previously and the more recent of the Richter scale findings in the levels at 5.73. The absence of complete records and proper communication between primary and secondary care professionals were significant contributory factors to his needless death, and two crucial days were lost during his stay in that particular hospital. Finally, he was transferred to Cork University Hospital, and it was here that we first heard mention of calcium in relation to Kevin, the level now being at 6.1. It was weekend. Unfortunately, he was managed solely at register level. Senior personnel uh, were available, they were on call, but they were not called. More aggressive treatments were not available at the weekend. During Sunday, Kevin was lucid, he was very sleepy. Uh, I remember it was an on Ireland Sunday in Cork were playing Mead, and uh, his dad and brother went home to see the rest of the match. No one had intimated that his life was in danger. And they left, and his sister and I remained. The SHO came in, did a quick check on Kevin, and turned away before he reached the door of ICU. Kevin suffered a massive heart attack and died as his sister and I sat at the bedside. I sent her running through the hospital corridors and it all happened so quickly that she actually catch, caught up with her dad and brother before they reached the car in the car park. So they returned and after a while a nurse and a doctor we had met previously came, came out and they said, uh, the nurse said, we have a room over here. And I looked at her and I said, it's not good you're taking us to this room. So when we went in, the doctor said, Kevin was very, uh, was very sick. And I said, is he fine? And he said, yes. And I immediately then asked the question, what about organ donation? Because Kevin carried a donor card. And I suppose at some level it was me grasping it on straw that some bit of Kevin might live. And the doctor shook his head. Kevin had been allowed to deteriorate to the point where his organs were no use to any other human being. And to me, that was like Kevin dying twice. And the doctor saw the effect that answer had. And he said, would you like us to inquire about his eyes? And I said, yes. So his corneas were donated. And we later learned that a 60-year-old man and a 42-year-old woman now had sight. And that is Kevin's patient journey where we do see that every point of contact failed him. Uh, it is a journey which could have been considerably shortened and successfully shortened had appropriate interventions occurred during his contact in particular with primary care. And what were those shortcomings? There was the inability to recognise the seriousness of his condition, appropriate interventions not taken, selective and incomplete transmission of information, non receiving of that information, the absence of that integrated care pathway, the link between his behaviour and test results, his developing neurological problems, <coughs> and no evidence of tracking of his deteriorating condition, and there was absence of direct communication with the patient. There was his treatment at register level. There was the team dynamic. How come somebody in that team didn't say, well, if you're not calling senior people, I will do that. There was the impact of a weekend admission. We talk about patient-centered care, but in effect, this patient was asked to accommodate the system. Please stay alive until Monday. And Kevin just wasn't capable of doing that. And our expectations of a tertiary training hospital certainly were not well. And in a later conversation with Sir Liam Donaldson, who at the time was chair of the World Alliance for Patient Safety, he likened Ken's patient journey to a manifestation of Jim Reason's Swiss cheese money. And after his death, what are appropriate responses to patients in the aftermath of adverse events? Well, yes, there were honest and humane reactions from individuals, and I'll always be grateful for that. In particular, I remember the nurse. She sat at the bedside with me. She was stroking my arm. She was crying as freely as I was. And I said to her, you know, but don't you see this every day? And she said, oh, no, not that. That should have never happened. She named it. She said it as it was. 
and to my dying day I'd be so grateful to her for her genuine honesty. It was hard to hear what he needed to be said. Uh, but then a very short space of time, the <coughs> corporate um, process of damage limitation kicked in. One doctor described his dilemma as an issue of loyalty to colleagues. He was the senior partner in the primary care practice. And another in the hospital, the head of the department, uh, suggested, and I bring up the post-it note again, suggested that in relation to that post-it note, that even if, if it had been seen by his consultant colleagues, it would not have meant anything, anything to them. And I said, Hi. well, he said, it's not written as we write it. So I said, may I see it again? And I looked at him and I said, are you saying that because it's not written in scientific notation, it wouldn't mean anything to somebody like you? And the man actually said yes. A suggestion that CL might not mean calcium, SOD might not mean sodium, POT might not mean potassium, and they all are in each other's company. And it was at that point that I lost <coughs> faith as I identified a reluctance to be honest and open, and in, a, in essence, just being basically decent. And that is why we, a family who never in our wildest dreams consider litigation, found ourselves forced down that route to get answers, the kind of answers we needed to know. Cases like ours need to be heard in an adversarial environment where the focus is not on blame, but rather on honestly arriving at the truth, acknowledging what happened, and identifying ways to prevent truth.